Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So today we are going to start with a new topic. Um, it's topic 28. It's called Transition Metal. This topic, um, there is no AS related topic to Transition Metal. So this is a completely new topic which has only been introduced to you for the A2 syllabus, okay? It falls under the in inorganic chemistry together with your uh, periodic table, group two, group 17, nitrogen and sulfur, okay? So those are, well, personally, my least um, favorite, okay? Right, for the learning objective, we are going to define the transition element and then to state the electronic configuration for the first row transition elements and of their ions. So you will need a little bit of your AS background on electronic configuration. Okay, before we define the transition metal, uh, let's just have a look at what D block elements are. The D block elements are your group three and between your group three and group 12. Okay, so in the periodic table, you have this as your group one, group two. So this uh, where scandium is, that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So that's why we have sort of renamed our group three as group 13 now, okay? Because group three to group 12 is your D block elements. Uh, before we look at the electronic configuration, oh, bef uh, before I forget to mention, if you see in the textbook where it says transition metals, AKA the D block element, that is not true because scandium and zinc are not transition metals, okay? So scandium and zinc are not transition metals. So if you see textbook where it says transition metals, AKA the D block, then that's wrong. Like this diagram, this diagram is actually wrong, okay? But I just want um, to use this diagram because it highlights the D block elements. Before we look at what D block elements are, which you should already know, the S block elements, the P block elements, um, Let's have a look quickly at the uh, arrangement of your orbitals and shells, subshells, okay? So your shells, or what we call the principal quantum number, will start from shell number one, or n equals to one, shell number two, n equals to two, shell number three, n equals to three, and shell number four, n equals to four. In the first shell, you've only got the S subshell, which contains one orbital. In the second shell, we've got 2S and 2P subshell. 2P subshell contains three orbitals, which means it can hold a maximum of six electrons. In the third subshell, uh, in the third shell, sorry, in the third shell, there are 3S, 3P, and 3D subshell. Okay, so the 3D subshell contains five orbitals, which means it can hold a maximum of 10 electrons. So each orbital, each box, can only accommodate two electrons max. Um, the most interesting bit about this part is that the 4S, orbit, uh, 4S subshell or 4S orbital overlaps with the 3D subshell. So that means the 4S is lower in energy than the 3D subshells. If you look at atom in this model, okay, uh, where the electrons is like in a circular motion around the nucleus, then the shell number three and the shell number four will confuse you, okay? Because by right, you will think that anything that falls in shell number four would be further out or higher in energy than the three, the third uh, shell, okay? So that's why this model of atom breaks down because um, electrons don't actually move around in circular motion, 
Okay, so they're more like in the form of energy. We label them according to their energy level. Okay, so um, if you remember also the rules to fill in electrons or uh, arrange electrons, aka electronic configuration, you would start from the lowest energy first, okay, singly paired, and then um, you move on to the to the next uh, energy level. So looking at 4S and 3D, because 4S has a lower energy level, 4S will be filled first, okay? That's when you fill in the uh, electronic configuration for atoms. However, when forming ions, okay, instead of filling in electrons, it's easier, especially for the D block elements, it's easier to remove atoms so that it becomes a positive ions. Okay, so when writing down the electronic configuration of a D block ion, always start with the electronic configuration of the neutral atom first, and then you just remove one electron plus one. Remove two electrons plus two, okay? The reason for that is because the electrons in the 4S orbitals will be removed first, right? If you fill in the number of uh, electrons for the ions, you will start filling in the 4S, which is not correct, okay? Right, so these are the electronic configurations of your D block elements, okay? Only titanium to copper are your transition metals, right? The reason uh, will be uh, explained to you shortly. Um, for this D block elements, the first part, okay, this is the electronic configuration of argon. So if you remember from your AS, actually you can just write down the shorthand notation in a square bracket, argon. Okay, that represents this whole thing. So the only thing that we are interested in really is the 4S and 3D subshells. Okay, so you can see that for all, well, almost all these D block elements, the 4S subshell is being filled first, and then only your 3D subshell. The reason we call them the D block elements is because the last filled subshell is the D subshell. Okay, we call them the D orbitals. If, uh, sorry, we call them the D. Um, blocks. If we are looking at the S blocks, we are looking at the group 1, group 2, the last fill, filled orbitals would be either their 2S or 3S or 4S. Okay, it's the S orbital. Same thing if we are looking at the P block, the last filled subshell will be their P subshell. Okay, this is your group 13 to group 18. Right? Um, okay, now I do want to point out um, the electronic configuration of chromium and copper, okay? So if you look at chromium and copper, these two elements are the exceptions and they are the only ones where they are the two um, metals that have their 4S subshell half filled, 4S1 instead of 4S2. Okay, so I will talk about that here, all right? You don't have this um, uh, diagram, but you can draw it out actually in your, actually, I will just use this diagram so I can draw it out. So looking at chromium, if it were to follow their friends, this would have been 4S2, 3D4, okay? But they are written as 4S1, 3D5. Okay, so if I draw the 4S orbital, I'm not too big. If I draw the 4S orbital and the 3D5 orbitals, 
for chromium, this is my 4S and this is my 3D. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so this is if they follow their friends. Now, um, there is a statement that says a half filled subshell or a completely filled subshell is more stable energetically. Okay, so if I'm looking at 3D subshell, full filled or a completely filled D subshell would be 10 electrons. Okay, a half filled would be 5 electrons. So can you see that this is 4 electrons at the moment? And if I move one of the electron from the S orbital to the D orbitals, I now have a half filled D orbitals. Okay, and this is more stable. 3D5 is more stable than 3D4. Okay, right, so that's why they don't. So I will just draw that and show that this electron can actually be promoted. So that's why we have written it as. 4s1, 3d5 instead of 4s2, 3d4. Okay, because half filled is more half filled d subshell is more stable. Same thing like copper. Um, I think I've also mentioned this in your AS, but just in case you you really cannot remember anything. Um, I will just go through this quickly again, okay? Uh, same thing for copper. Okay, if it follows their friends, this would have been written as 4S2, 3D9. Correct, 4S2, 3D9. So 4S2, 3D9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight, nine. That's how you fill in electrons. You uh, fill them in singly first and then you pair them up, okay? Same thing, this is a 3D9 at the moment, but if I move this electron to make it 3D10, that would have been a more stable uh, configuration or arrangement. Okay, so 3D10 is more stable than 3D9 because it's a completely filled subshell. So if I were to draw that, we promote it or remove it to the 3D uh, subshell. That's why we write it as 4S1, 3D10 and not 4S2, 3D9. Okay, so... Let me just check where you can write that down. Um, okay, so the reason for this, chromium and copper, is because half fill and full or complete fill D orbitals or D subshells are favorable energetically. That means stable. Lah. The energy is is okay. Energetically cannot spell. Energetically. Okay. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, forming ions. Okay, before we, we haven't actually defined transition metals yet. Okay.
Okay. Right. So if I just go back to, oh, I haven't gone to that slide. Rupanya. Ah, it's this one. Okay. Right. When we form transition metal ions or D block ions, we it's easier and it's more correct to lose the electrons than to fill them in from the start, from the bottom. Okay. So for example, uh, the rule is 4S subshell lost first, followed by the 3D. Okay. So the electrons in the 4S will be lost first and then only the 3D electrons. So it's so tempted to think that, okay, 3D subshell is the outermost shell because it's got the highest um, energy level compared to all the other subshells, okay? But that's just the rule. You will lose the electrons from the 4S first and then followed by the 3D subshell. Okay, so let's see. The formation of scandium 3 plus, SC3 plus, is when you lose three electrons, two from 4S and one from 3D orbitals. Um, same thing, like chromium, chromium 3 plus, you lose three electrons in total, one from 4S and two from 3D. So you're left with 4S0, 3D3. Okay, so... Um, the number of electrons you lose will be uh, reflected on the charge of the ion being formed. Okay, like if it's a two plus, that means you have lost the two electrons from the 4s. So that's why the most common, okay, the most common oxidation state in the D block elements or the transition metal is plus two, because this means that you are losing the electrons from the 4s orbitals. Okay, so we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more later. Um, next, I want to define transition metals. The definition of transition metals in your notes is um, a D block elements. Okay, we are looking at the D block elements. It forms one or more ions, okay? So, um, wait, what's happening here? Has one you raised your hand? Ka? Oh, okay. Sorry, I got a notification. Um, right. So back to my definition. Uh, transition metals are D block elements. Okay. Yes, these are all D block elements. They form one or more stable ions. Okay. Um, for example, we just look at example first. Iron, Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. So iron can have more than one type of ion. Right. Um, with incomplete or partially filled D subshells. Okay, so why scandium 3 plus and zinc 2 plus is not considered as transition metals? Okay, um, I'll just annotate here first. Later, I will tell you what to write in the box. Okay, so. Scandium only has one ion, which is SC3+. Okay? Likewise, zinc only has one ion as well, which is zinc2+. You will not see zinc+, plus or zinc3+. Plus, okay? Whereas copper, you can have copper2+, plus, you, have, you can have copper+. Plus. So that's the first criteria that scandium and zinc don't meet, where they have more than one ion. Okay. The second criteria is when they form ions, 
their D subshells must be incomplete. Okay, so you look at scandium. The D subshell is empty, right? Whereas zinc, the D subshell is full or complete. We don't want that. By definition, we want the D orbitals to be incomplete. So D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, 6, D7, D8, D9. Okay, this is what we um, define as incomplete D subshells. All right, so you can see already from there uh, why zinc and scandium don't meet the requirement. Okay. Okay, so we'll fill that in. Um, to explain why scandium and zinc are not transition metals. So starting with scandium first. Uh, scandium only forms one ion, which is SC three plus SC three plus ion has no electrons in its three uh, D subshell. So that's two criteria of being a transition metal uh, violated. Violated? Okay, not met. Um, the second one, zinc, also only ion, which is the zinc 2 plus, and zinc 2 plus has a complete 3D subshell. That's why these two D block elements. They are metals, but they're just not uh, called a transition metal. They're just a, a D block element or a D block metal. Okay. Okay, so that's done. That's our definition of transition metals. <clears throat> so the others from titanium to copper, they can form more than one um, ions. Okay, so that brings us to the next part, which is one of the features of being a transition metal, is that they have variable oxidation state. Okay, so explain why transition elements or transition metals have variable oxidation states in terms of their 3D and 4S subshells um, and understand that they have variable. Okay, right. So this is a table of the most common oxidation states for our transition metals, okay? This is not to say that only this oxidation state, there are other oxidation states as well, but maybe not as stable, okay? Later on, you will see that Fe can have an oxidation state of plus six. Um, right, so transition metals have variable oxidation states where each metal can form more than one ion. When the transition elements form ions, the electrons can be, can be lost from the 4S subshell followed by the 3D electrons. That's why they can have more than one. Whether they lose just the 4S electrons, in which case titanium will be 
plus two. If it loses three electrons, it becomes plus three. If it loses four electrons, it becomes plus four. Okay, so only transition metals, transition elements can do this. They can lose as many or as little electrons um, as they wish. Okay, now the pattern that I want you to see at the start of the row, what I mean by the start of the row is that we are looking at um, titanium to copper from being left uh, from going left to the right, okay? Like if you look at the transition metal, uh, if you look at the periodic table, we start at titanium here and we go to copper, okay? Start of the row means this part, the early part. Another thing to notice is that as you go from left to right, the number of electron, uh, the number of protons are also increasing. Okay, if there's more number of protons, if your atomic number increases, it gets more difficult to remove the electrons. Okay, so we now want to look at the start of the row, which is somewhere from titanium to manganese. Okay, the maximum oxidation number of the transition elements at the start of the row involves all the 4s and 3d electrons being lost. Okay, what do I mean by that? If you look here, titanium, the maximum oxidation state is plus 4, where we lose all the 4s and all the 3d electrons. Vanadium, plus 5. Okay, that means we can lose at this point. Um, the nuclear charge is not as strong. Okay, uh, chromium, same thing. We can lose uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yes six electrons. So if we lose six electrons, the charge or the oxidation state would be plus six. Manganese, same thing. If we lose two here and five here, we lose uh, all seven electrons. It becomes plus seven. So only from titanium, titanium up to manganese, the nuclear charge is weak-ish. Okay, so it's possible to lose all the electrons. However, from Fe onwards, from Fe to copper, only the plus two oxidation state dominates. That means it's the most stable, okay? Because from Fe onwards, the nuclear charge is getting stronger. You now have more uh, atomic number. Your atomic number is increasing, right? So that means the 3D electrons are becoming harder to remove because your nuclear charge is now stronger. Okay, so from Fe to copper, most you're most likely going to just lose the electrons from the 4S subshell. Okay, yes, you can. You can remove all the electrons as long as you provide enough energy okay so so as i said just now there is fe6 that means you lose one two three four five six okay you can lose electrons from the 3d subshell but it requires more energy to overcome the stronger nuclear charge and if you require something uh, with higher energy that means it's unstable okay so the oxidate that oxidation state is not as common so the factor that place that that comes into play is the nuclear charge factor. Okay, now you have more protons, so um, your electrons are not easy to be removed for the three D subshells. Okay, so you notice that they say the elements are more likely. Okay, that means they just favor. Okay, doesn't mean that it cannot. They can lose the three D electrons but just not favorable okay okay oh now we just want to um, do the questions examples on how to find the oxidation state of the transition metals okay so this is also a revision from your as syllabus 
topic six, electrochemistry. Okay, so to find the oxidation state from a monoatomic ion, monoatomic ion means there's only one atom, and a polyatomic ion where you have more than one atoms and different different types of atoms. Okay, so if you have a monoatomic ions, the charge two plus is the same as the oxidation state. Okay, the way you write the oxidation state is also important. Oxidation state is written as the charge, the charge, the sign first, followed by the number plus two. If you do it the other way around, okay, uh, Cambridge examiners said they will penalize you. Okay, so you cannot write oxidation state as two plus because that is only um, written for charges. Okay, Fe three plus is also a monoatomic, so the oxidation is plus three. FeO four two minus, you have to do a little bit of work. If you can do it and visualize it in your head, that's great. Okay, but if you don't and need a lot more um, than you need practice. You just remember, this is one of the rules. I just don't remember which rule number. The sum of all the oxidation state in the formula is equal to the charge of the ion. Okay, so I don't remember which rule number, but to work that out, um, of course, it, it's the transition metal uh, that we're interested in. Okay, so <clears throat> when we add the oxidation state of Fe plus four times the oxidation of oxygen, the sum should be equal to minus two. Okay, um, oxygen will uh, have an oxidation state equals to its charge. Okay, not all the time. There are some cases, but when it is with transition metal, it would have an oxidation state of minus two. So you just work it out, minus 2 plus 8, <clears throat> sorry, minus 2 plus 8 would be plus 6. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so that means the oxidation state of Fe is plus 6. That's why I always... Um, don't encourage students to learn that oxidation state is equals to the charge because here the charge is minus two, but the oxidation state of Fe is plus six. Okay, so there's no, especially if it's not a monoatomic. If it's a monoatomic, then of course there's nothing else to worry about. So the charge of the monoatomic ion is the same as the oxidation state. Okay, but for polyatomic ion, the charge is not the same as the um, oxidation state. And another thing is that iron with an oxidation state of plus six will not be Fe6 plus. Okay, this species doesn't exist. As I said, Fe, um, when we lose the six electrons, you will require a lot of energy. So this ion is not stable. It can be stabilized by combining it with other atom. Okay. So <clears throat> you have basically you just have to memorize. Huh? If you want to write down, uh, not not so much for ion, uh, not so much for iron, sorry, but maybe things like manganese or uh, dichromate, you have to uh, remember the formula. Okay, next. Um, these are 
the ions and some molecules that contains manganese. Mn2 plus is monoatomic uh, or monoionic. So the charge is 2 plus, the oxidation state is plus 2. Same thing with Mn2O3. The sum of all the oxidation state is equals to its charge. It's neutral, so the charge is 0. So Mn is equals to 0. So Mn should equals to um, 3 times minus 2 is 6. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. So that's plus 6 over 2. Plus 3. Okay, you will continue with MnO2. If you can see it without do, um, doing the working, then that's great. Mn is equals to plus 4. MnO4 2 minus means Mn plus 4 minus 2 to, becomes, uh, to become minus 2. So that's minus 2 plus, this is plus 4, minus 2 plus 8, plus 6. And lastly, which is uh, the most common um, manganate ion that you meet, MnO4 minus, Mn is equals to minus 1 plus 8, so that's plus 7. Okay, so we write manganate ion as manganate 7, VII, where the number in the Roman numeral uh, represents the oxidation state. Okay, so whenever you see a Roman numeral in uh, the name, it represents the oxidation state of a transition metal in that formula, okay? So that's why uh, there's no such thing as Mn7+, plus because that will not be a stable ion. Manganese with an oxidation state of plus 7 will only be stable if it is combined with other atom like, in this case, oxygen, okay? Okay, next, you can continue with the next one, which is um, vanadium. Okay, so you can start with the bottom two. Vanadium two plus would have an oxidation state of plus two. Vanadium three plus would have an oxidation state of plus three. So you just have to work out the v VO2 with a charge of plus one and VO with a charge of two plus. So... Be careful here with this two formula that looks almost similar <clears throat> but different. So plus two plus three VO two plus means V is equals to plus one plus four plus five. Okay. VO two plus means V is equals to two plus two plus four. Okay, so that's the quickest way um, to do it. If you cannot see it instantly, then you will um, use the working that I did earlier, um, which is a much slower method. But if you can do it without working at all, then that's the best approach, but making sure that you don't make careless mistakes, okay?
OK, if you're done with this one, you can start reading the next example, 2.2, where we are looking at zirconium. Zirconium is now um, in the second row of transition elements. It sits below the titanium. So that means zirconium is in the uh, start of the row. OK, start of the row, usually you can lose your 4S and 3D subshells. That's the most important um, thing to remember. The position of the transition metal can tell you how easy or how difficult it is to lose the 3D electrons, or in this case, zirconium for D electrons. OK, so I'll just show you where zirconium is. Zirconium is here. It sits below titanium, and this region is considered the, the start of the row where it is relatively, okay, relatively easy to lose the 4S and all the 3D electrons. So if we go back to the question, um, predict the maximum stable oxidation state. So the highest oxidation state would mean removing all the 4S, uh, sorry, 5S and 4D electrons. So that means you remove two from 5S, you remove two from 4D, you remove four electrons in total. So it's an oxidation state of plus four. So the reason is zirconium is below titanium or in bracket at the start of the row this involves losing all the 4d and 5s electrons <clears throat> okay give the formula of the oxide of zirconium assuming zirconium is in the oxidation state of plus four okay so if zirconium is four plus and oxygen is two minus it's between a metal and a non-metal so it's an ionic um, compound and ionic is usually written to its lowest lowest ratio okay so the answer is that r o two OK, next property of a transition metal that we want to look at is its behavior as catalyst. OK, so understand that transition elements uh, can behave as catalyst. Explain why transition elements behave as catalyst in terms of having more than one stable oxidation state and vacant d orbitals that are energetically accessible and can form dative bonds with ligands. OK. So that's a mouthful, <clears throat> which I will, I think it's easier to explain using diagram later on. OK, so since transition elements can have variable oxidation, they make a good catalyst, just like that reaction of the persulfate ions with the iodide ions, where Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus are acting as catalysts because they can have variable oxidation. So that means it. The, the oxidation can change in a reaction and then they can go back to the original oxidation state because that's the criteria of a catalyst. At the end of the reaction, they stay unchanged. Okay, Actually, they were involved in the reaction, but they are being regenerated. So during catalysis, the transition element can change to various oxidation states by uh, reduction, gaining an electron, or oxidation losing electrons. Um, iron is a great example of transition metals being a catalyst. Um, I don't know if you remember that catalytic con converter, they also use platinum, uh, palladium. So these are all transition metals. Um, 
Okay, so if we're talking about heterogeneous catalysis, you need to remember that three modes of actions, um, adsorption, reaction, and desorption. Okay. Transition elements with high oxidation states make powerful oxidizing agents. Potassium manganate, KMNO4. This is your famous, oops, famous oxidizing agent, KMNO4. The reason why is because its oxidation state is too high that it wants to go lower. Okay, so for example, it's at plus seven, it wants to go down to plus two. So itself, this manganese wants to be reduced. In order for it to be reduced, it needs to oxidize another person. Okay, so that's why um, any transition metals with high oxidation states tend to be a strong oxidizing agents because they themselves want to be reduced because they, their oxidation state is too high. So as you can see, this is how they name the potassium permanganate with the number seven in the numer um, num uh, Roman numeral in the bracket, which indicates that is the oxidation state of the manganese. Not potassium because potassium is group one, so potassium will always have an oxidation state of plus one. Okay, to the next statement, that uh, the second statement just now in the learning objective, um, vacant d orbitals. So what do I mean by vacant d orbitals? Now, if you look at titanium, for example, if you form titanium 2 plus, you lose the electrons in the 4s orbitals. Okay, so that means you have this empty or vacant d orbitals, which can uh, receive electrons from other people, other species, okay? So this electron donor is what we call ligands. I'll show you in a bit. Um, but that's one way of seeing, seeing a vacant d orbitals. Another way is that when these transition metals form ions, they lose electrons, for example, uh, chromium, they lose electrons, chromium 3 plus, they can also rearrange their electronic configuration. Instead of having three electrons that are singly paired, what they can do is that the electrons can come together, okay, so that they have more vacant d orbitals, okay, so re they rearrange themselves. <coughs> They put themselves together in the same orbital so that there is more available um, d orbitals or d subshells. So when transition elements form ions, they have vacant d orbitals which are energetically accessible. So that means the energy is not too high lah, and um, it it's easy for this species to donate electrons. This species is called ligands. Okay. Right. Um, ligands actually form dative bonds. Dative bonds is something that you also have met in AS. Another name for it is coordinate bonds. It is a type of uh, covalent bond. So the normal covalent bond, actually I'll use a different color. The normal covalent bond would have one atom A sharing its electron and uh, another atom B will also contribute its electron, so they form a normal covalent bond. Whereas dative, only one atom provides both the electrons for sharing, okay? So that's the difference. They are still sharing their electrons. The only difference is the source. Okay, Instead of coming from each atom in dative or coordinate bond, both electrons come from the same atom. Okay, um, okay so the dative bonds is formed between the methyl ion and ligands. In order for a species to be ligands, of course, it needs to have a lone pair of electrons. So in this case, in this example, 
A is acting as the ligand because it has the lone pair of electrons. Each ligands provide a pair of electrons required for the formation of the dative bond between the ion and the <coughs> ligand. The pair of electrons will be donated into the vacant d orbital of the metal. That's why transition metals must have vacant d orbital so that ligands can donate its uh, lone pair of electrons. Okay, so. Um, what I can show you is this one. This is an example of uh, when we look at the electronic configuration, these orbitals belong to, in this case, the example is aluminium. Okay, so we have 4S, uh, sorry, uh, 4S and 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so these orbitals need to be empty or vacant. Um, are available so that the ligands, in this case, water is acting as a ligand because it has a lone pair that it can share or donate, so that the lone pair of ligands can occupy the d orbitals. Okay, if your d orbitals is filled, then you cannot put in two electrons. In total, you will have three electrons per orbital, and um, that that doesn't work. Okay. So that is all for today. In the next lesson, we are going to look at this ligand and um, complex formation. So this is an example of our transition metal uh, center. It is an ion. And then our H2O is the ligands where it donates or it shares its lone pair of electrons. Together, they are called a complex. Okay, so this is metal center, water is ligands, and the whole thing is called a complex. So we will be looking at the shape, the oxidation state, the charge, and the type of ligands as well, whether they are monodentate, bidentate, or polydentate. Okay, so that will be for the next lesson. And that's it. We are done for today's lesson. Okay, uh, stop recording.